All right. Good morning. Today I'm going to be reviewing with you guys what you covered this week for civics. Um, should be a pretty quick review just because there wasn't a whole lot that we covered this week as we're just kind of starting off a new unit. Um, before I get going too far on this, I did want to briefly just kind of talk about why we're shifting this and talk about the transition since we did just kind of jump from the Supreme Court to, um, you know, interest groups and people who influence the government. Um, so just to kind of quickly explain this transition, uh, at the end of the Supreme Court cases that kind of wrapped up the judicial branch, you guys looked at how it worked, the major decisions that they made, and the uh, ins and outs of you know how we pick justices, what we look for, and the powers that the Supreme Court has. Um, traditionally, we would have had a test there, but due to the distance learning, um, we're not going to be doing tests just because it's kind of difficult to carry out. So I might um, occasionally have some larger scale projects for you guys to finish up as your sort of test grade per unit. Um, but the bracket and your research was that for the judicial branch. And so that just kind of that wraps it all up. If for whatever reason you have any lingering lasting questions about the judicial branch, just let me know and um, I'll be more than happy to answer those. But otherwise, we're going to get right into this new unit, which is primarily going to focus on interest groups. And the reason I want to talk about this unit is because I think it's very important because up until this point, we've talked about the ideal functioning of our government in a perfect world. This is what all of our different branches are supposed to do and how they're supposed to look out for each other and how you as a citizen are supposed to be represented. But in reality, there are a number of constraints that prevent that from happening. And so we have a number of organizations that have developed kind of naturally in our political process to account for this. And the most significant of them are interest groups. And they are a source of a lot of controversy in today's society, and there's a number of legislation pieces that have caused problems with it. Um, one of your Supreme Court cases from the last unit actually dealt with these exact things and their role in elections because they've become so controversial, which we'll talk about more later as we move on. So uh, overall, the goal of this unit is going to be to help you kind of understand what are these other groups that participate in the political process, process that aren't necessarily elected by the people, but still serve a very important role in what sort of laws get passed and help you formulate an opinion on whether or not you think these are a good thing to have or if they should have more restrictions if the Supreme Court does need to be involved, things like that. So um, in this review, I'm going to talk about the things listed on the board. So we're going to emphasize the importance of the public sphere. I know it's a really simple term. Um, I just want to go over it very briefly and why I had you do such easy vocab. I'm going to emphasize and kind of summarize why interest groups exist, why we have these. Um, we're going to talk like why it's kind of inescapable. We're going to talk about um, how they direct policy, make sure everyone's kind of clear on what exactly they do and why they are so effective. Uh, and then I just want to itemize those pros and cons that were in the video. So make it clear like these are the benefits and the negatives of this. So you have that sort of baseline going forward as we start to look at some actual uh, applications of interest groups and their effect on society. And then um, I have a question section. Um, I didn't get any questions about this unit this week, so there won't be any. That's just kind of there because I forgot to get rid of it. All right, so public sphere. Uh, you guys at the start of this week had a reading on this, uh, the public sphere, public agenda, public spotlight, all of that. And, and it's all pretty straightforward. Uh, like they're, they're simple concepts. The public sphere is just what we talk about and it's what politicians are supposed to represent. You and I and all of our opinions are part of the public sphere and our elected officials are there to go and make sure that laws are passed that take care of our public sphere and make sure that we are represented accordingly. Um, the reason I want to emphasize this concept of the public sphere though is because uh, it's very much the concept of the ideal. And that in that ideal world, Politicians are perfectly engaging with the public sphere and their constituents and us who occupy it and representing us and hearing our voices and um, hearing what we care about and focusing on that, focusing on the main ideas of the public sphere. The problem is that politicians have a limited amount of time. As we talked about when we were looking at the judi or legislative branch, um, Congress only meets for a limited period of time. And then on top of that, politicians themselves, there's only so many hours in the day. And they only have so many, even out of that small chunk that they can use focusing on making sure they understand what we are concerned about. 
Um, and so with that limited time, both for hearing opinions and limited time for making decisions, politicians have to have a limited focus. They are not going to cover everything that everyone considers important, which I mean, should seem obvious, but I think it's worth noting. Like we talked about how few laws actually make it out of Congress. Uh, and in part, that's because of this. It's because they have a limited time. They cannot get to all of them. And so they have to prioritize which laws seem like the most important. They have to choose what they place their limited focus on. And so that's where that concept of the public agenda comes from, is that again, in an ideal world, us as citizens are all going to express concern for something more than some, for certain topics more than others. These are going to be what we deem to be the most uh, important things. So this is kind of like the natural progression of the limited focus made available by politicians in the public sphere. So the public agenda gives them that focus. It's the public as a, a group kind of agreeing this is what we care the most about, whether that is health care, minimum wage, uh, gun rights, um, immigration. That's All of these things are in the public agenda for we have to come up with solutions. However, on even there, we still have the problem in that uh, not everybody agrees what's important. Like uh, even within your classroom, I'm sure some of you think that immigration is more important than others. And you also have different opinions on that. And so you have a lot of different voices clamoring for attention. Politicians have to figure out the agenda somehow and they can't go and listen to everybody. Um, just like if I have a class of 35 students, I can't go around and individually sit down with each student every class period and say, all right, what are your questions? What are your questions? What are you most concerned about? Um, I need to have some sort of kind of unified, simplified way of figuring out, okay, what are our problems? And this is where interest groups really pop up. They are the solution to the problem of all these voices shouting for the attention and trying to get the focus of politicians on their personal most concerned topic. Interest groups at their core are a result of efficiency. And that's why we need to focus on them because our system is inherently slow. Um, it's part of the democratic process. If you guys think back to the very start of this semester when you tested different forms of government, democracy gives everybody a voice, but when there's so many voices, it becomes inefficient and slow to hear all of them. And so interest groups at their core um, are important and worth discussing because they allow groups of people who all have similar interests to get their point across in less time and also without repeating those points. Um, it's much easier, right, uh, to instead of having everybody ask their into que question. So let's go back to the classroom analogy. Um, I could, again, let's say if I wanted to make sure you all your voices were heard, I could go and meet with each student individually, say, okay, what are your questions? I'll answer them. Good deal. However, I might answer the same question multiple times. Like um, Kayla and Isaac and Brayden and Peyton all might have the same question, but I'd only hear it from each of them and I have to repeat myself. It's much more efficient if instead we do class like we usually do when we were in the classroom where uh, one person raises their hand, everybody listens, I answer the question, everybody gets the same information, that person expressed the point. Uh, similarly, uh, interest groups kind of serve this function where um, if one group of people, so let's say auto workers, um, all auto workers are concerned about safety, like safety standards in their workplace. Uh, auto factories are very unsafe. Uh, each individual could go talk to their local representatives or they could form an interest group, choose one person to go speak on their behalf, and then that person tries to get the attention of the politician says, I represent the auto workers, uh, the UAW, uh, the United Auto Workers Union. Uh, and I have said that our people are most concerned about health and safety standards. You have now made it take less time because one person is talking or one small uh, head of a group is talking and they are summarizing and distilling down what are the biggest concerns of that group. And so um, this is why interest groups occur and why they're kind of inescapable. And so from there, interest groups have two main ways of trying to adjust politicians' focus. And that's either by shifting the large scale public agenda, our right option, or by directly influencing the politicians, the one kind of in my example where they go and talk to them. Uh, and they have two main strategies for each of those that they try and use. 
which is hopefully what you should have taken away. So when they're trying to shift public opinion, that first approach or that public agenda, um, the goal behind this is that you can't be ignored. So maybe they just don't want to talk to your representative. Fine. But if your interest group can get everybody on the same page, all of the public thinking that this is an important topic worth considering, then politicians can't ignore them because it's a large scale issue. Um, it's right in their face. And so the two main strategies there are organizing protests because this draws attention. You have enough large scale prote protests, politicians have to acknowledge that, okay, this is something the public cares about, or they can support PACs, which in your crash course, it should, talk, should have talked about how these are political action committees. And while they're not the same as interest groups, interest groups oftentimes can throw resources at them because uh, if a PAC can go and deal with campaigning and trying to get somebody elected, they can still, again, decide the agenda by convincing the majority of the public that these are issues that they should be concerned about and these are the types of politicians they should be electing. Uh, and then on the direct influence side, we have two main ways that they do so, which is by providing research. Again, this is a function of efficiency. It saves time. Uh, a single politician. So um, Dick Durbin from here in Bloomington Normal, he doesn't have time to go and talk to every single farmer and figure out um, how they're being affected by current agriculture regulations. However, uh, the interest group an agriculture interest group could do that. They could go and interview every farmer because they could hire a bunch of people to go and do that. They collect all this data and then they can give it to politicians and say, look, here's a problem. Maybe they're being overregulated and you can see because we have all this data. And so they are doing the research that the politician can't. And by summarizing that information, making it easier for the politician to realize, oh, this is a problem. This is a major um, area that needs my focus that I would have never been aware of because I just don't have the time to collect that data. Uh, and then on the more extreme end, they can outright suggest uh, language for laws or write laws to again save them the time, make it more efficient. Um, sometimes a politician might not choose to support a um, particular issue even if it is a major thing that needs to be focused on because of the simple fact they do not have time to sit down and write out all the wording of the law like they're like yeah i really care about this and i vote in favor of it but someone needs to write it because i'm already doing all these other things because i'm one person and i'm very busy interest groups take that and get rid of that problem they say all right well look here here's this law i did it i made the law for you you can review it and then you can suggest it so again interest groups acting as a source of efficiency and so this brings us to kind of the conclusion of today's summary which is uh and the question we're going to be trying to answer as we look at this, these, kind of, these groups throughout the course of this unit, which is, are they worth it? Are interest groups something that are good to have in our society or are they something that we really do need to regulate? And we'll look at a lot of concrete real world examples to help you kind of see if uh, interest groups are a force of good or a force of uh, evil in our political process to be kind of melodramatic. Um, but currently the pros and cons kind of boil down to these four points. On the pro side, um, interest groups, people are concerned because they seem like they give more power to one group over another uh, and drown out the little man. But the idea behind them is um, there's no restrictions on them, right? Anybody can form an interest group. Anyone can pool their money, their resources, their time and effort to try and create this more efficient method of getting their point across to politicians. And if everybody can do that, then it's fine because everybody has an equal opportunity. It's that same kind of like Incredibles model. Just everybody's super, no one is. Uh, if everybody has an unfair representation in an interest group, then it's not really unfair anymore. Uh, they also provide research. And so this is really, really is a benefit in that um, politicians can make more educated decisions rather than just going off of what they think or what they've heard. They now have the data to back up their laws that they support or the laws that they oppose. Now, if they decide that they do want to, uh, you know, ban bump stock on assault weapons, that's a thing that's come up. They can have the data to show that bump stocks actually are associated with more violence or alternatively opposite. Maybe they have, have all the data to prove that no, uh, mass shootings are just as deadly without access to bump shot stocks. And so we don't need to pass a law on that. Uh, on a more local level, um, interest groups are very important because they provide a source of networking where um, say I as a teacher am very passionate about common corn. I think it's terrible and I wanna get rid of it. Um, 
And how do I go about that? I don't know who to talk to to try and influence my politician. If I become a part of an interest group, um, they can now put me in contact with other people with similar concerns and give me this sort of network of people that I can bank on to try and form my opinion and get my voice out there. And then also it just gives people a small voice. Um, oftentimes politicians pay attention to who is the loudest. And in American society, if you want to be loud, traditionally you need to have money. You need to be able to either get your opinion out on the internet by buying ads, you need to get it on television by buying ads, or you need to get it in printed documents by buying ads or advertising space, because that's what's generally put in front of people's faces. And money is needed to do that. And so again, if I want to try and get rid of Common Core, I lack the funds to draw the attention of a politician. The best I can really do is write a letter and hope that I'm really persuasive and it's a real good letter and maybe they want to listen to me. However, if I join an instant interest group and throw my money and my time behind that, now I have pooled resources which allow me to have a larger influence through the work of the group rather than just me as an individual. However, there are negatives as well, and that's where we're going to kind of end today, which is that um, money is king, like I just said. Money buys advertising, advertising buys opinions, and shapes the public agenda more than anything else. Um, and some interest groups are wealthier than others. The idea that everyone is super it doesn't really work if some people's superpowers are way better than everybody else's. Like, uh, if one person has the, is indestructible and can't die, and then one other person can just lift a little more weight than others, like one's better than any other in the same way. Uh, for example, oil interest groups have a lot more influence than teacher interest groups because oil, the oil industry is a money industry. They are super wealthy. And so they have way more money to throw behind their groups than a teacher's group because teachers do not make the same amount of money as oil barons. That's just kind of one of those facts of life. Um, continuing with the cons too, there's also the issue with um, writing laws, which um, kind of in some ways defeats the purpose of politicians when suddenly this group is deciding what our laws are. It's not really the person you elected. It's the group that has their own ulterior motives, and that's not super democratic. Uh, on top of that, there's lobbying, which is a lobbyist is someone, and this should have been in your videos that you guys watch, the lobbyist being the person that outright goes and talks to the politician and tries to influence them. And lobbying is kind of super sketchy where it's like almost bribery, but not quite because lobbyists will oftentimes gain, engage in really kind of sketchy behavior where they'll take a politician to dinner uh, and they might buy them a super nice dinner or they'll take them out on this nice trip or vacation. And so it comes with like these sort of added benefits that aren't really and at that point, it's not so much about necessarily what they have to say, but how nice the area are, is that they are in when they're saying it. Like, sure, an oil lobbyist might be asking for some really terrible changes, but if they give them a really nice dinner, well, like, maybe it sounds nicer. And so it's kind of this gray area of almost bribery. And then overall, interest groups are just kind of less democratic because uh, it stops being about the people shaping public agenda and public opinion and more about the group. And so you are just re reducing the number of voices that are claiming for attention. And while that's sometimes good because it's efficient, it also suppresses opinion because even if you join an interest group that has similar, int um, similar goals as you, you're not going to get all of them. So like if I join a teacher's interest group because I want to get rid of common core, but I also want to raise our pay, but the interest group doesn't care about that, well then now it's less about that concern and more about what the interest group wants the politicians to think. So um, that's kind of what we've covered this week. Next week, again, we're gonna be looking at interest groups in society and in particular some of the strategies that they employ. So like they try and shape public agenda. And like on the previous slide we talked about, they try to shift public opinion. So what does that look like? How do they try and influence it? Uh, we'll look at that, we'll look at different strategies they employ, some examples of those. We'll watch some ads and videos to kind of give you a feel for that. Uh, also, what are some of the more influential interest groups and um, what do they care about? What is our public opinion focused on currently? So we'll look at some actual samples of interest groups as well. So um, that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, stay healthy.